Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Jordan Lloyd and Colorgraph. Peter Moore, the beeps and the static you were listening to a moment ago might have seemed prosaic enough, but in reality they marked one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. You were listening to the signal that was transmitted back to Earth by the Soviet satellite Sputnik 1 on the 4th of October 1957. Sputnik's entry into orbit heralded the start of the space age and the start of a new era in our changing relationship with the night sky. Throughout human history, this relationship has shifted. For scientists, the night sky has been a puzzle. For voyagers, it has served as a map. For people of many religions, it has existed as a source of awe and solace. Perhaps the artist Vincent van Gogh described it best when he wrote that he felt a tremendous need to go out at night to paint the stars. The night sky and our human relationship with it is a subject that today's guest has long pondered. Stuart Clark is an astronomer and a science writer. He writes for The Guardian, New Statesman, and has produced documentaries like Music of the Spheres for BBC Radio. His new book, Beneath the Night, has recently been published and it traces our relationship with the stars from prehistoric caves to the space shuttle age. To be in with a chance of winning a copy of this book, just keep listening. In this whole vast story, it's the sound of those beeps from Sputnik 1 that mark one of the most important moments. Here is Stuart telling me much more about that history on a travel back through time. I'm going to start off by saying, Stuart Clark, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's um, a conversation to really look forward to this because it's such an exciting evergreen topic, uh, yours, Beneath the Night, which is... The book that you've written, which we're going to structure our conversation around today. Um, congratulations on the book. Thank you very much. I just, I loved writing it and just pulling together so much of my personal history and also um, just looking back at culture, society, art and science and just seeing how it's indelibly sort of imprinted um, with the night sky and references to it. Absolutely. I wanted to start with a quote from the 18th century, which is from, I imagine it's from the spectator, it's by Joseph Addison anyway. And he says, when we survey the whole earth at once and the several planets that lie within its neighbourhood, we are filled with a pleasing astonishment to see so many worlds hanging one above another and sliding around their axles in such amazing pomp and solemnity which is a, a very lucid, eloquent way of putting this picture of the, the solar system together in a paragraph. It's a longer quote than that, but I thought I'd start with it because it captures something of the feeling of awe which permeates your book. So whatever your, like, kind of, you know, whatever kind of theatre of history you're looking at, whether it's religion or science or poetry, I think it's that feeling which unites it all together. And I thought I'd uh, get you to begin this conversation maybe by telling us a little bit about an anecdote that you describe later on in the book when you're in Sliding Spring Mountain and you have a moment looking up at the sky. Yes, it was, it was quite extraordinary because I was, a, I was a graduate student at that point and uh, this was the first time that I had been to Australia to use one of the, you know, the very biggest telescopes in the world at that time. And it was just extraordinary that I, I, I was standing there and I looked up at the night sky. And this was my first time deep into the southern hemisphere. And just by a, a, a cosmic coincidence the northern hemisphere points away from the center of the galaxy but the southern hemisphere points towards the center of the galaxy so there's just so many more stars that you can see in in the southern night sky and uh, it was 
a beautiful, beautiful night. I mean, that's why the telescopes were there. It's hardly any light pollution there. You know, absolutely pitch black. And the stars were so vibrant. I mean, extraordinarily so. There was a couple of things that happened. One was a sort of an intellectual thing, which was that this is how most people who have lived, you know, have seen the night sky, um, you know, in ages past. This is the kind of level of detail and brightness at which they would have seen the night sky. Um, and it brought it very close to you. And this was the other strange thing that happened is I had this feeling that the stars were so close. It was almost like they were um, sort of luminous, ripe fruit just hanging there in, in the sky. And it, I, I almost ha had this feeling of wanting to reach up and, and, and pluck one from the sky, hold it. I felt they were so close I could touch them. And holding those two um, concepts in my head, this, this, um, this idea that the stars are extremely far away, distant suns, you know, just viewed from, from extreme distance, and yet feeling that I could touch them was a profoundly strange moment. And I think that's the first time I truly experienced what I'd now recognize as, as awe um, and the sort of a feeling of uh, what Kant might call the, the cosmic sublime, this idea of, of just being, um, you know, immersed in this wide, vast, beautiful universe. Mm, it's an um it's an episode that you relate that really resonated with me as well because i was in the south island of new zealand but in the northern part of it so it's called queen charlotte sound a beautiful part of the world mm. where again the, the, the kind of similarity is that there's very little light pollution i suppose we're you know kind of live in a in a very polluted light area in um, in europe and especially in london when you don't see much else than a 747 going ahead but that that, that sense of um you know kind of having a moment under the night sky was really quite striking and it made me think actually that we often talk about um our age as a time of of, of loss of nature that we're living through an extinction era etc but one of the great losses of our human experience is probably that connection with the night sky would you say that's a fair point yes i think that is a fair point but i would I would caveat it and that is that I think that our relationship with the night sky has changed constantly throughout history and whilst we might not be so aware of being beneath the night as it were now with our um, tendency for urban living we still maintain an extremely strong connection to the night sky and the wider universe and that's through the imagery and the information that's coming back from the various spacecraft and telescopes that are sort of being our robotic eyes and ears out in in the universe and the solar system and we see acts of con concept of the night sky and the wider universe as we depict it in art and entertainment changing as well it's not a, an, an austere black and white place anymore but it's a place of vivid color um, you sort of see it most prominently i suppose in the works of science fiction in the cinema these days that um, space now is depicted as very is all colorful nebulae um, rather than just uh, large voids of black and the occasional um, pockmark of, of stars that are on there so it's a fascinating moment to sort of reflect i think on 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 how we've changed our relationship with the night sky throughout all of history in fact i think that's a really nice way of describing it as an evolving relationship rather than one um which has maybe become retrograde or gone backwards or mm. you know that this is um a nice way to put it and it really fits within this idea that you have in the book of charting this you know kind of relationship as it is through all these various moments in history and seeing what people mm. look for from you know van gogh looking at the starry night as a way of solace to cure him after his loss of religious faith 
or mm. maybe even the Dominican friar. I was interested in this story of Giordano Bruno, I think, mm. if I can summon up a bit of Italian, who yeah. was a bit too curious about it and ended up being burned by the Inquisition for this idea that there might be life out there. And it's... Yes. Um, it becomes a kind of unifying force, doesn't it, the night sky then? Because you you know that, and, and this is right at the, the start of your book, you know that this is exactly the same image that's presented before people in deep history, you know, yes, beyond the record. Absolutely. Records. The emotional feeling that you have, I think, is is the same um for for everybody so again it's it's using this concept of being beneath the night and looking at the stars in in awe uh and using that as an empathizing force across all of humankind um both living and now long long dead that's a really really nice setup but of course what we're going to do is as ever, follow the Travels Through Time podcast, where we limit you to a moment or a few moments in history in a particular year. So let me start off by asking you this question, which I put to everyone who comes on. If you could travel back through time, which year would you like to visit? Yeah, this was so difficult. I mean, <laughs> so difficult. I hope and... you spent days and days pondering. Pretty much, actually. <laughs> and my initial thought was to go somewhere into deep time um, because there's just so many unanswered questions. Um, and then in the end, um, I plumped for 1957. And one of the things that's very interesting to me about that time period is that it, it's, it's in the aftermath of the Second World War, there is massive technological progress that is happening and you know extraordinary forces of nature have been harnessed in the in the atomic bombs and the hydrogen bombs and there is a real feeling i think that we are on a sort of knife edge with technology mm. that it you know we we have to keep control of it it's capable you know we have harnessed extraordinary power um, and some people would even say you know we've harnessed the power of the stars themselves so the the, the fusion that takes place in a hydrogen bomb to give the extraordinarily large explosion that's the same process that keeps the stars shining for eons in the night sky and here we have brought this cosmic force down to earth and it's a force that's so large that of course people are seeing that it can lead to destruction of of, of humankind completely well i was just thinking that you've um made me reflect i suppose on the fact that science for so much of the history that preceded that was seen as a very positive force that was improving society in so many ways but i think people have just been scared half to death by the prospect of what it can do so that description of yours that of, of being on a knife edge is is actually quite a provoking one Ab absolutely and i think whereas in the the first world war the the science of chemistry um you know, was was the thing that gave us the, the bad things the the mustard gas the poison gas and all those kinds of things now in the second world war it's physics that's done it and so suddenly a uh, perception of sort of science um, as a benign force of of knowledge gathering is, is being challenged in the most um, it, sort of in the strongest way it, it possibly can mm. and I'm not really sure that scientists of that era were equipped to um, defend science and the use of it or had sort of considered these wider implications uh, and and so it becomes a difficult time to be a scientist to be studying science and yet at the same time there's still a huge optimism for the technological future of the earth in the 1950s this this idea that through technology we can lead um, easier um, more fulfilling lives and perhaps do 
these extraordinary things, harness these powers to do extraordinary things like explore space. And, and I wanted to ask you at this point, because there's something I had never heard of before, but which is an important catalytic thing in the story that we're going to follow through, which is the fact that 1957 was chosen as the International Geophysical Year. Could you tell us what that meant, please? Yes, of course. So this was, this was a great, um, it was designed to be a kind of great healing um, moment, really, and a coming together of scientists from across the world to study the Earth as a whole thing. So to try to understand how, how the planet Earth works as it were, what are the physical processes that are going on? Can we look at it as, 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 as a whole thing and study it as a, as a system, uh, a self-contained system to, to grasp better knowledge of our home and you know, what, what makes it habitable, what keeps it clement. And so it's, it's got a, although it comes from a sort of physics side of things, the geophysical year, it does have nascent environmentalism in it, which is fascinating for where we see we'll go with, um, with space exploration and what that sort of tells us. Perfect. So the International Geophysical Year is on, well, it's in process. Where would you like to go to for your first scene, please? So my first scene is very specific and it's the 4th of October in 1957 and it's onto the Kazakh steppes in Kazakhstan, specifically to a place that um, uh, we now know as the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And it is here that a group of Russian rocket scientists are preparing for what will become the f launch of the very first satellite into space. And that satellite is, is Sputnik 1. Wow, there's quite a lot to unpack here. I think we're quite familiar with the, the vision of a launch nowadays. Usually they take place in Florida and there's, you know, etc. How different to that picture that we have in our contemporary minds is what's going on here in Kazakhstan. Is it a bit more of a um, smaller affair? Do you know? Yes, it's it's a bit smaller. It's a it's a little more touchy feely. It's um, you know it's like a group of engineers in a pretty desolate place actually that have been building ever larger rockets launching them into the sky and you know most of them have fallen and crashed and burnt back to the earth and that's just the way they did things they were engineers from the build it test it learn from it okay. school so this idea that we have nowadays of all our computer modeling and um, things being flown inside computers first mm. and then launches you know almost going always um, to plan you know that, that's not what's happening here this is real engineering yeah, yeah. And of, one of these engineers is one character we have to look at in particular who's called Korolev um, yes. can you tell us about him because he seems to be the chief um, actor in the scene he is so Sergei Korolev he was so important to the Soviets that they would only refer to him in documents as the chief designer no one knew his name until after he died because they were afraid of Western assassination attempts. Um, and Korolev um, just drove this Soviet space program trying to, to get a satellite into orbit. And the reason the geophysical year is important is because it was a stated aim of America that they would launch a satellite to look at the earth from space so this was going to be the crowning glory of uh, this this study this scientific study that this would be the first time that we would be able to see our planet from above and see it as a celestial object in its own right which is and such an exciting prospect and correlates yes Korolev thought um, that this was something that, this, that, that the Soviet Union should claim for itself. And these rockets that were being used by both the Americans 
and the Russians. These were the same rockets that had been designed to carry um, the nuclear missiles, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, and rain destruction down on each other, you know, across from across the world. So they were being repurposed here um, for scientific um, means and propaganda means and technological supremacy um, bragging rights as it mm. were it's really interesting to see this interplay between the military and the exploration um, aspects of these rockets Korolev and his team arrived at the abandoned V2 sites uh, and sort of retro-engineered the, the rockets that they found and worked out uh, and learned from them to see what they could use and uh, then transported these uh, ideas and the techniques in uh, to augment their own ideas and techniques uh, to, to start their um, rocketry program back in the uh, Soviet Union. It's fascinating to so, see that through line from 1944-45 to 1957, but I suppose in his own right, I mean, it, this is unfair to say that this is just German technology that's been repackaged by the Russians. This um, Korolev is um, a very, very skilled engineer, isn't he? Yes, absolutely. He, you know, he's, he, he's, I mean, I would put him at genius level, really, in terms of engineering and, and vision. It's no spoiler to say that uh, you know the Russians may have launched the first satellite um, into space, but they didn't get to the moon first. That was American. And I think my my gut instinct and feeling is that if Korolev hadn't died um, prematurely, it would have been the Russians on the moon first, because he had such a clear vision of how to do it, how to how to build bigger and bigger rockets and and make this happen and so there was a sort of a leadership void um when he died in the 1960s that uh, yeah. that no one really filled and the americans so intriguing in. that's so intriguing but if we go back to this day on the 4th of october when sputnik one is there in kazakhstan would um korolev have been there or would he have watched from afar and can you tell yes, us what he would have yeah, so he would have been there. And so, you know, they would have been up by the rocket, getting it all ready, standing on the launch pad there. There's a really interesting image that the Americans had taken with one of their very high altitude spy planes, where they found um, the, the launch site. And you can see there the launch tower, very similar to the way we'd think of a launch tower um, today that the rocket is placed against. They've dug out the great big fire pit and the flame guard so that the exhaust can be channeled away in a safe direction. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very similar really to a launch site uh, architecture today, but it's much more um, sort of early and primitive. It was this a successful, was it a successful launch? This launch was successful. So when the rocket went up, then the, the, the team are in the bunker and they're listening, uh, they're, they're getting radio signals back from the rocket. And what they see is that the rocket isn't, it's, it's going okay, but it's not firing quite as efficiently as they hoped it would. And they, they're going to lose the signal very soon after launch as the rocket goes over the horizon. And uh, and, and so they can't see the radio signal. And Korolev decided that they were going to wait for the approximately 90 minutes or so for the satellite Sputnik 1 to come round the, the whole Earth and complete an orbit and sort of rise above the opposite horizon. Because he knows that if they can pick up the signal, the, the, the bleep bleep of the satellite, and that's all that Sputnik 1 did, so that they could try and win this race, they didn't put a scientific satellite up into orbit, which had been their first idea, they just put a radio transmitter up there. And so they're waiting in the bunker, they've watched the rocket fly up into the heavens and now they're waiting to see if it reappears over the horizon was an hour and a half you say that must have been so tense my goodness that must have been so so tense and the soviet leader nikita khrushchev 
he's waiting in in Kiev is actually where he is and he's been hosting this dinner party or attending this dinner party at the Marinsky Palace and he's he's keeping everybody up it's about 11 p.m getting later into the night um, everyone's very tired after dinner but Khrushchev is not moving and so nobody else is moving because he's waiting for a call which he thought would have come in an hour or more earlier so Korolev is waiting and then suddenly the transmitter in the bunker bleeps back into life and there's a signal from the satellite it's not in the highest orbit that they wanted it to get to but it is in orbit and it's going to circle the earth now um, for a good number of weeks wow. so Korolev phones Khrushchev and Khrushchev takes the call he goes out, uh, an aide comes and gets him, he goes and takes the call. He comes back into the dinner party and he says the Soviet Union has just launched the first artificial satellite around the Earth. Mm -hmm. And Khrushchev's son, in his memoirs, remembered that his father looked triumphant as he announced this. And everyone else just smiled politely because they had no idea of the importance of what had just happened. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm sitting here with a big smile on my face because it's it's a huge moment in human history. In fact, there was a launch a few months ago that I watched with my little boy, and we watched it together on the um, on the television from our, you know, they were, they were in Florida, and I remember they interviewed someone who'd been there and watch this launch. I think it was one of the, the news correspondents who'd never seen anything like this before. And they were kind of lost for words because they, it was almost that they'd just seen something transcendental. It was something that, you know, defied all laws of reality as we understand them. So to imagine what it must have been like for Korolev and his team there, having, you know, been the first to mm. do this. Yes, I th it's just it's just ex it's just extraordinary. Your story reminds me of um, a lovely uh, moment at the height of the Apollo um, Moon program, launching these enormous Saturn V rockets to take astronauts to the moon, and and those launches became sort of lightning rods, really, um, for the civil rights movement and people asking, why are we spending money uh, to put white people on the moon? Mm. And there was a, a, a demonstration and a protest um, of black people marching on uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, in Florida to protest against the, the the rampant inequality in society and this sort of wanton use of, of money when there was so much else that need to be fixed. And after he'd made his point, political point, uh, the leader of this protest was asked um, whether he'd seen the rocket launch. And he said, yes, he had. And it had been the most spectacular thing he had ever seen in his life. So it oh, wow. is this super interesting thing mm. of you know, this idea that we have of doing something extraordinary like this and touching the night sky, this mm. sort of going into space, um, sending people up there. You know, it's, it's kind of more than that I've come to realize with writing this book because we're actually touching the night sky, which has been seen as the ultimate removed realm from us for most of human history and yet you know we are the uh, sort of the the people at this time in history that can now do this in the rest of his life well to be there with him at that moment of maximum accomplishment because there can only be one first can't there and he's got the first rocket in space sputnik one right okay let's go to your second scene where would you like to go to next please so it, it's a few days later and it's uh, in West Virginia mm. and it's, uh, it's to be standing next to a gentleman called Homer Hickam, who was a young boy at this moment, but he grew up to be a NASA engineer. And the reason for choosing him is that he had an epiphany, almost, I think, a bit like the uh, the, the, the epiphany that I had on, on Siding Spring Mountain when he was standing underneath the night sky and saw Sputnik 1 cross 
the sky. So where, where do we start? There's so, much, so many ways we can go, but I think um, there's a little bit we should fill in before we get to Homer Hickam and his character. I want to ask you a few questions first, and, uh, and they're probably quite obvious ones, because um, if Khrushchev has found out about this, the, the launch of Sputnik has been a success, the news has got to break internationally, hasn't it? And um, what happens? Can you just just say what happens in the immediate aftermath of the launch? Yes, this is this is really interesting because the Soviet Union sort of play it down. They announce it, but not in a really um, you know triumphalist way or anything like that. It's just They're kind of casual. Uh, we've just put it as really rocket. Ca- yeah. Space. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's just like yeah, it's just what we do. Yeah. You know, um, no we'll do big, something no, on Wednesday as well. Yeah, yeah no, no biggie. Um, and of course, the rest of the world go, goes crazy for it. This is just huge, huge news, and it's it's right at this moment. You know, the the, the term space age is actually coined right there and then about we've entered the space age. And it comes, um, to some people, it comes as a very inspiring thing. And to others, it, it, it's horrifying. And mainly from a political point of view, because if you can now overfly any territory on Earth almost, you know, within a space of 90 minutes, you know, how does that, what does that do for national security and all these, all these kinds of things? So it, it just, it just explodes in the media. Uh, and, and then the, 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 the Soviet media sort of picks it up and is, is much um, more vociferous about the achievement and what it means. Okay. And so my second question um, is uh, still related to Sputnik and it's obviously what Homer Hickam is looking at in the second scene as we're with him. I think we're used to this idea of watching the International Space Station go over. In fact, my my phone beeps occasionally and tells me that it's going overhead. Um, But obviously, this would be something um, completely novel at that point. How easy was it to see? Was it the kind of thing that you could just go out in your garden and look up? Yeah, so this is, yes, it was, in fact. Now, this is another piece of Korolev's genius. So, and, and to set the scene, it's, it's sort of worth just reiterating that the night sky doesn't change. You know, there's, the, there's constellations that we see um, change with the seasons. And then the, the naked eye planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, you know, they make their stately way through the, the constellations, the zodiacal constellations. Uh, and so if you're very patient, you can watch them moving sort of week after week. Um, but nothing really flashes through the night sky or changes about it, apart from the odd meteor shower or the appearance of a comet or something like that. So this realm was a a serene place of unchanging patterns that have lasted for eons you know if we go back to prehistory and look up at the night sky you know with the sort of human ancestors um the the patterns of the constellations will will be somewhat deformed and changed because of the way the stars gradually move through space but we still recognize them so here was a moment on which you could actually see something you know, moving across the sky from horizon to horizon in a matter of minutes. And the initial idea was that the radio transmitter that Korolev um, put onto Sputnik 1 would just send out a beep beep. And so anyone could tune in with their uh, radio and listen to this signal coming from space. They'd hear it um, increase in volume as it came above one horizon and then decrease to nothing as it went down over the the, the opposite horizon. Korolev, however, also realized, although the Sputnik 1 satellite itself which wasn't even a meter across, it was about half that, um, was going to be extremely faint. The the larger upper stage of the rocket, four meters or so, that would reflect sunlight and be quite, um, quite bright from the Earth. 
So to ensure that it was the brightest it could possibly be, he had his engineers install reflective panels all over it so it would be as bright as possible. And that's what people saw, Homer Hickam included, um, rather than the actual satellite itself. But it was, it was just emblematic and people just said they'd seen the, the, the Sputnik as it came overhead. It is a way of marking it as a moment in history and making it accessible to everyone who wants to see it. I think that's the, that's the point for me that, you know, I think is so important about what Korolev did here. It's, it was something that could be seen, interpreted uh, and discussed by everyone on the flight path. Exactly. But particular Homer Hickam. So what does he say? Because I think he actually records his response to the site, doesn't he? Yes. And I've chosen this. He, he wrote this in his memoir, um, a book called Rocket Boys. And uh, I, I chose this moment because I just I think it's emblematic of what a lot of people were thinking. So he writes... I stared at it with no less attention than if it had been God himself in a golden chariot riding overhead. It soared with what seemed to me inexorable and dangerous purpose, as if there were no power in the universe that could stop it. He's got it absolutely spot on. When I was researching this book, this was a, an initially a little bit of a, well, was a big surprise to me about how much work the sort of 18th century philosophers did and the poets of the time in trying to make a new scientific understanding of the universe to bring it into a, a human sphere of understanding, if you like, something that wasn't just confined to mathematicians and, and people like that. And through these ideas of the sublime, it, um, it seemed to be that the wider universe, the night sky, this is the the, the, the poster child for the, the sublime experience, as it, as it were. And it was so interesting to me that in that passage, um, Homer Hickam just lands on it straight away, this inexorable and dangerous purpose, this thing, space and now rocketry, that's so powerful and so indifferent to us that we cannot help but be somehow you know in 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 servitude or in thrall or to it we can't hold it we can't contain it we can just be within it he's definitely feeling quite a lot of cognitive dissonance there isn't he because i suppose he's just so excited and um you write as well really nicely about the political context as well of this so at the same time you've got the new york herald tribune calling it a grave defeat for america in the battle between communism and capitalism which is being played out in the night sky it reminds me um i suppose you were talking about the 18th century a few minutes ago and they do have a a kind of practice run for the space age in a way because they have the hot air balloons which take people up into um the clouds for the first time and there's lots of um i suppose parallels in the way that people respond to the disturbing nature of that like the, the sense that we're not actually supposed to be up there there's something fundamentally wrong with what they're doing and you have words with um writing there's a lovely start to peter bell i know when he uh that's one of his poems and he says there's something in a flying horse there's something in a huge balloon but through the clouds i'll never float until i have a little boat shaped like the crescent moon and it's a it's a wonderful <laughs> opening to this poem of this person like um doing something a little bit devilish but doing something quite exciting mm -hmm. at the same time and i think that's what you're expressing completely here with with homer but i think what, what i also wanted to ask you about because we're so used to especially from our western centric perspective of the space age thinking of it really being a time of american triumph because they got to the moon first all those great apollo missions that that, that went on and um really that's that's not the story of 1957 is it at all no ab absolutely not this is this is the story of 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 sort of western hubris run aground really 
and the the concept of of american manifest destiny and the frontier spirit and the artists of the 19th century that created those i mean just extraordinary works of art of the you know the american west and conjured in imagery uh, the the sort of sublime and awesome landscapes and there's this wonderful artist called Chesley Bonnestell who's working in the 1950s as well and he's a photorealistic artist so he's worked on um, paintings for backdrops in Hollywood the Hunchback of Notre Dame films like this he's worked for construction companies trying to raise money so he's painted uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco uh, as it will be as they hope to build it things like um, that what in, he's also an amateur astronomer so what he decides to do is paint what he believes to be photorealistic images of the solar system what Saturn would look like if he was standing on one of its moons um, what the moon um, would look like if you happen to go there and he translates all the uh, all the paintings of the uh, American West and the style of these awesome landscapes into this uh, sort of space outer space realm, and so I believe that the the American people felt that space was theirs. It that was their manifest destiny to uh, explore space, and so when the Russians started to have success after success after success first satellite first person uh, you know uh, and all of these kinds of achievements it was a big big blow to them mm. and of course there's project vanguard which happens pretty much simultaneously <laughs> which happened it kind of ends in a big fireball at the launch site doesn't it which is the american equivalent to sputnik Yes, absolutely. So they they sort of rush um, Vanguard onto the uh, onto the launch pad in order to try and just uh, you know a month later uh, get something up um, into the air, and it, it it just and they they get all the television cameras there so they can transmit it all live and and of course it just goes completely wrong. Um, it's uh, yeah, it, 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 the, I think uh, it gets about a meter off the ground before it sort of fall, falls backwards. Yeah, so the, the phone call to Eisenhower isn't going to be quite as cheerful as the one to Crucia. Hello, it's Peter here. A few weeks ago, during our episode on Fidel Castro at the UN in 1960, you might remember that I told you about Jordan Lloyd's set of colorized images on the march to Washington. Well, it's a set of images that's full of narrative power and political significance at the moment. And it's been really great to see it take off on social media over the past week. The set has been liked on Twitter an extraordinary 220,000 times. And if you want to see these fascinating pictures too, then we'll include a link on this episode page. Jordan has also been crafting some superb images on the Beatles, on Castro, on Oscar Wilde for us here at Travels Through Time. This week, we're really lucky to have another. It's from the NASA archive in the 1950s, and it shows a very Blade Runner-ish view with huge machines and sodium lights at the wind tunnel at Langley Aeronautical Laboratory in Virginia. To be in with a chance of winning a print of this image, along with a copy of Stuart Clark's Beneath the Night, all you need to do is head to our website at tttpodcast.com and sign up to our mailing list. Once you're on the list, you are in the hat. Full details of the prize are available on our episode page. Good luck to you. We've got one more scene. I really want to get this in and we've got time left yet. So where, where shall we go? From that, we'll leave Homer Hickam uh, watching. Yeah, and uh, so that again, this was a really difficult one to um, decide. I had a couple of people's offices that I would have quite liked to have been in. Eventually, um, I, I plumped for the American journalist Alexander Marshak, and in the aftermath of the the launch, he tried to put everything together and make sense of, of why human beings wanted to, to travel into space and to, and to touch um, the night sky. Uh, and the journey that he, that begins that day for him, I think is utterly fascinating and that is still influencing scholars today. 
So tell us a little bit more about Alexander. I think that's probably the best place to begin. He's a journalist. He's a uh, distinguished um, journalist. Uh, he's forever going to be remembered, however, as this uh, journalist who started work on a book about why human beings wanted to explore space and ended up becoming an archaeologist with no formal training and having such uh, an uh, influence on archaeology that he sparked a discipline um, that we uh, call archaeoastronomy and which today has merged with anthropology um, to form cultural astronomy and the investigation of, of, of our enduring fascination with the night sky throughout all um, of human history. So it's an enormous project. And if we think of him in the context of these Sputnik launches in 1957, is this process underway already or is it um, in kind of genesis at that point? I think it sparked at that moment in him, okay. this interest. Um, so as so many other people at that time, you know, he was captivated um, by this launch and by the realisation that space was now a realm open to human exploration. And he started to do articles and to interview people. And sort of being the, the journalist that he was, he didn't take it for granted that this was an inevitability. He wanted to understand why the people that were doing this wanted to explore space. What was the motivation behind it? And this is where it becomes particularly fascinating, mm. is because it wasn't as if anyone could say why they wanted to do it. There was no fixed goal that they had. It was almost as if um, the interest was just primal in some way. I know you and mentioned was, um, you mentioned George, George Mallory's response to why he wanted to climb Everest, and he says it's because it's there. Yeah. It kind of captures it almost as well as anything, doesn't it? Yeah, it, exactly. And, you know, Kennedy um, even uses that quote um, when he gives his famous speech um, at, in Houston at the Rice Stadium, um, saying that America is going to go to the moon by the end of the decade, you know, and they're going to land on the moon because it's there. Mm. And so Marshak realizes, you see, that um, it's just somehow in people to, be, to have this fascination with the night sky and therefore to try to, to touch it in this way is, is sort of like the, the, the uh, it's like a no brainer kind of thing. So he changes his line of investigation and he says, well, if nobody that's working in this field today can explain why they want to do it, then it must have come from tradition. And so he starts looking back in history to see where this tradition might have come from, where this, this fascination uh, and this attraction to the night sky came from. And this is archaeoastronomy. This is what it becomes. This, this is what it becomes. And he gets all the way back through to before written records. Um, so the first writings that you, know, you find, um, the Sumerian texts, things like that, um, they're talking about the heavens and why the, the night sky is up there, how it's a mirror of what happens on the earth down here. So it's deeply ingrained um, in humankind. Hmm. And Marshak believes that, he's, that, that some of these artifacts, these prehistoric artifacts um, that are not widely studied at this time. So these are things like bones or bits of fossilized wood or things like that, that seem to have um, tally marks on them. So notches that don't appear to be art, and yet they're on there for a reason. Um, he starts to wonder whether those are the first primitive forms of charting uh, the passage of time by say counting the phases of the moon or something like that. Mm, which is it's kind of nice to think about um, this process being um, 
you know kind of set in motion by the 1957 Sputnik launches because to to us I suppose we'd think about them immediately as them pointing the way to the future where in fact they are actually the prism through which Alexander Marshak goes right back into the past. One of the biggest mysteries that we can look up into the night sky and feel the same fascination as our ancestors from tens, you know, if Marshak's right, maybe even hundred thousand years ago. It's quite extraordinary. It is absolutely. I mean, you um, write, I think, about the various ways in which they are using the night sky, and some of it's quite practical, isn't it, as a kind of celestial clock. And then other things are about, you know, like kind of maybe more ceremonial. We notice that time can be marked out by the movement of the celestial objects. Day and night is obviously linked to the sun and its movement through the sky. The month is linked to the moon and the lunar phases that it goes through. And then the year um, is linked to the appearance of the different constellations with the seasons. And I think it's that coincidence, the fact that the way we move through space shows us different constellations at different times throughout the year, which appear to be the heralds of seasons. That's, one, that's, that's both a practical link there and it also begs explanation. And I think as, as people try to explain that, um, that's where we see a lot of these ideas of early astrology and forces from the the planets and the night sky influencing the conditions on the earth is this this discipline of archaeoastronomy um kind of sets out to answer just those questions i wanted to ask probably a final question about um where that discipline is today from this origin moment in the office of um Alexander Marshak. Yes, it's, a, it's fascinating. People that study this subject have tried to integrate more and more anthropology with the archaeoastronomy to try and see what culture, society, and, and the people were like in those days in order to come to a better understanding of how they, in their unique environments and with their unique outlooks, would have related to the night sky. And so this really? is, yes, and this is what's now called cultural uh, astronomy. And it's through that um, prism that uh, people are now looking. Well, it all starts, you know, as it did for me in New Zealand and you in Australia by looking up, I suppose. That's the thing that unites it all. It's a wonderful story. I've enjoyed this immensely. I'm sure that's come across. But I've got one final question I want to ask you before we leave this very, very invigorating, enlightening history. If you could bring one object back to have as a talisman or a memento from 1957, maybe to um, get you out of bed a bit quicker in the morning or to get you more excited when you're sitting down at your writing desk, what would you like to have? Yeah, so I thought about this one as well. So what I decided I would do is that I would sit with Korolev as he's waiting by the radio receiver in, in Baikonur. And then when he went off to make his phone call to Khrushchev, I'd nick the radio receiver. The human, <laughs> um, the human piece of equipment um, that uh, received the first signal Transmission. from space. Yeah. Wow. What an object. Really, really, really enjoyed this, as I said before. The book's called Beneath the Night, if you want to go and find out. Um, the story in much more detail and I really think you should because um, you've captured a lot of the wonder a lot of the awe and so many wonderful stories at the same time Stuart Clark thank you very very much for talking to us today thank you so much Peter it's been a real pleasure that was me Peter Moore talking to Stuart Clark about 1957 and Stuart's new book which is called Beneath the Night it's recently been published in hardback by Faber and as you heard in the interview, it's a book full of little wonders. To find out much more about this episode, please do head to our website, which is tttpodcast.com. There you can read more about the scenes and the characters. You can view that striking colorized image from NASA by Jordan Lloyd of Colorgraph. And I'm going to put up my own picture of the night sky that I described. It's the one taken in New Zealand a few years ago. 
If you enjoyed all of this, you can also find Cassius St. Clair's episode on our website as well. That tells the story of how the Apollo 11 spacesuits were made. That's a really fascinating story. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday, but from me for now, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.